Okay, picking up where we left off the other day, which I believe is Act One, Scene Four. <clears throat> um, Laertes has just left. Polonius has given him advice, and Polonius asks Ophelia, what were you and Laertes talking about? She tells him Hamlet. And goes on and explains that Hamlet, line 91 or 92, he hath very oft of late given private time, uh, Polonius says, I've heard that Hamlet has very oft of late given private time to you. And by the way, that, that tis told me ties in with those elements of spying watching, observing, et cetera, that we see throughout the play. Because bear in mind, spying, watching, observing, that's not only done with the eyes, it's also done with the ears. And the implication is, he's asked. He's, what's my daughter up to, right? This isn't going to be the only child that Polonius kind of spies on. We're going to see a little bit later in the play. So he says, I've heard you spent a lot of private time with Hamlet. And he tells her, you do not, line 96, you do not understand yourself so clearly as it behooves my daughter and your honor. That is, what do you think you're doing? You don't understand kind of your rank, your position in society, and You've got the family honor also to defend, as well as her own personal honor. So what's up between you? <clears throat> and she says, he hath my lord of late made many tenders of his affection to me. Tenders, gifts, items, things like that. You've got a gloss down at the bottom about what's meant by tenders, okay? Offers is what the gloss says. And he says, affection. You speak like a green girl. Green girl means young girl, naive girl. We have no idea how old Ophelia is, all right? So he asks her, do you believe his tenders? Do you believe that whatever Hamlet has offered to you, said to you, etc., are sincere, that he really does have affection? I do not know, my lord, what I should think. And that line has caused, especially feminist critics, a lot of problems. Because it, it makes Ophelia just sound like an airhead. All right? And he says, let me teach you. Think yourself a baby. And that you've taken these tenders for true pay. Now, there, when he uses tenders, notice your gloss says promises to pay. When she used it, she used it as just meaning offers. Like to tender something to somebody means to give something to them. He takes it in a monetary meaning. Promises to pay, like a promissory note. You take out a loan, you sign a promissory note, you agree to pay off the balance of that loan by such and such, such, and such a date. He says, these tenders that you've taken for true pay are not sterling. We would say they're not dollar bills. Or we could go even back farther. We would say they're not based on gold. You know, the dollar used to be tied to gold. It isn't any longer. He's saying these are worthless. They're IOUs. Okay? She says, he, he hath importuned me with love in honorable fashion. Everything Hamlet has done and said, she says, has been honorable. He hasn't said, hey, baby, if you love me, sleep with me, kind of a thing. I fashion you may call it. Notice, he takes words she uses, and he responds using those same words with entirely different connotations. When she says, in honorable fashion, 
She means in an honorable way, in an honorable means. He takes fashion to mean like clothing that you can take on and put off. So, she responds, and have given countenance to his speech, my Lord, with almost all the holy vows of heaven. The gloss for countenance says, and have given credit, support to his speech. So how do you, how does credit and support help elucidate or illuminate or illumine that line? To me, it doesn't. I think countenance has more to do with his facial expression. She's saying, I can just look at him and tell that he's being honest. Polonius springs to catch woodcocks. And he gives a long speech. Springs to catch woodcocks. Traps to catch birds. Bird is a slang term in British usage. Goes back to Shakespeare's day. Probably goes back to the Middle Ages in some areas. Uh, it's a slang term for a young woman. Okay? So, he says, now Hamlet's blood burns. He's horny. He's hormonal and all that kind of stuff. So he says, you got to stay away from him. From this time, be somewhat scanter of your maiden presence, line 120 and following. Set your entreatments at a higher rate than a command of party. Why? Because Hamlet is young, and with a large tether, may he walk. That is, his parents, so to speak, have him on a long leash. She can't have that long leash. He says, don't believe his vows, for they are brokers. They are implorators of unholy suits. Brokers, implorators, like he's imploring you for something. What's he getting at? He's suggesting Hamlet's vows are for one thing, to get her into bed. This is an image that's going to come up a little bit later on. Hamlet's going to talk to Polonius. They're supposedly alone on the stage. And Hamlet's going to call Polonius a fishmonger. A fishmonger in Shakespeare's day had two meanings. One, a person who sells fish, and two, a pimp or madam, procurer of flesh, seller of girls and boys, all right? <clears throat> so, stay away from Hamlet. And she says, I'll obey. Scene four. We're back on the platform out in front of the castle. It's around midnight. And we hear Hamlet, Horatio, Marcellus, Bernardo talking about what's going on in the castle. Okay, So they're outside the castle. Castle doors are closed. And they can hear the partying going on inside. And... Horatio asks, what does this mean? And Hamlet kills him. The king is keeping, staying awake tonight, taking his rattles, keeping wassail, swaggering up spring reels, you know, dancing and drinking. Horatio, is it a custom? Is this normal? Hamlet, yeah, it is. But to my mind, though I am native here and to the manor born, manor born means to this kind of custom because of his aristocratic upbringing. Um, yeah, it's pretty much what his gloss says. He says, it is a custom more honored in the breach than the observance. That is, it is more to be honored by breaking this custom. So if this kind of behavior is a custom, what is he saying about the day? starting at the top, because everything that happens at the top flows downward. They're drunks. I think this is a somewhat, this must be a somewhat common English idea. In the old English epic poem, which Shakespeare did not know, it had not been translated into modern English, and he did not know old English. In the old English epic poem, 
Beowulf. The character Beowulf, who is not Danish, goes and visits the Danes to rid them of Grendel, a monster. And one of the things the poet makes very, very clear is that every night that Grendel comes to terrorize the Danes, the Danes that agree to fight him are drunk. I mean, dead to the world, drunk. The poet makes clear when Grendel comes in and picks a man up off the floor, the man doesn't even wake up. When he bites off a body part, the guy's dead to the world because he's so inebriated, all right? This is kind of tying into that. So, notice Hamlet says, this heavy-headed rebel east and west makes us traduced in text of other nations. They claim, that is, call us drunkards. Okay? So, the ghost comes in at the end of that speech. And Hamlet says, angels and ministers of grace defend us. Now, He's being redundant because angels are ministers of grace. Be thou a spirit of health or goblin damned. Bring with the airs from heaven or blast from hell. Be thy intents wicked or charitable. Thou comest in such a questionable shape that I will speak to thee. I'll call thee Hamlet, king, father, royal, dame. Oh, answer me. So, whether you come from God or from hell, whether you bring heirs from heaven, which means graces, blessings from heaven, or blasts from hell, whether your intentions are wicked or charitable, wishing, showing love for me, thou comes in such a questionable shape, I will speak to you. Questionable. I've got questions about it. And it also, let's see what else your gloss says there. Inviting question or conversation, okay? And notice what he says. Hamlet, father, uh, king, father, royal dame. Let me not burst in ignorance, but tell why thy canonized bones, hearsed in death, have burst their cerements. Why the sepulcher, the grave, we put you in, hasn't held you, okay? If you don't answer me, he says, what? I'll explode. And then he asks, your body was buried with all the rites of church. That's what canonized bones mean. Catholic church, Protestant church. Probably, at this point, time of Hamlet, Catholic. Okay? Full funeral mass and everything. Lots of prayers, committing the dead, etc. What may this mean, Hamlet asks? That, that body has arised. So, why is this? Wherefore, what should we do? And the ghost beckons Hamlet to follow him. Horatio and Bernardo, excuse me, Marcellus say, don't, don't go with them. Hamlet, I will, okay? Horatio, what if it tempt you towards the flood, my lord? Or to the summit of the cliff? That is, what if it tempt you to jump in the ocean or river or to jump off a cliff? Both of those would be instances of what? Suicide. Hamlet has already talked about, you know, in his first soliloquy, or that the everlasting had not fixed his canon against self-slaughter. He might assume some other horrible form which might deprive your sovereignty of reason and draw you into madness. That is, he might do something that makes you go crazy. Think of it. Hamlet says, I'll go on, I'll follow it. Okay? So they try to stop Hamlet, Hamlet leaves. He goes off with the ghost. So everybody else goes off through one door, Hamlet comes back out another door with the ghost. And Hamlet says, whether wilt thou leave me, speak, I'll go no further. That is, I'm stopping right here, you got to give me something. Ghost, mark me. That is, pay attention. I will. My hour is almost come when I to sulfurous and tormenting flames 
must render up myself. Hmm. Sulfurous and tormenting flame sounds like what? Not heaven. Hell. Alas, poor ghost. No pity me, he says. But listen to what I'm going to tell you. I'm waiting. I am, uh, speak, I am bound to hear, so art thou to revenge. And then we get to revenge tragedy. When thou shalt hear, uh, what? <laughs> Hamlet's like, what is it you want me to hear? I am thy father's spirit, doomed for a certain time term to walk the night, and for the day confined to fast and fire, till the foul crimes done in my days of nature are burnt and purged away. talking about hell. No. Traditional Christian theology, whether Catholic or Protestant, you go to hell, that's it. Your crimes aren't burnt away. You just suffer. Catholic theology, it's in purgatory that your crimes can be burnt away. Traditional Catholic theology, the majority of Christians, this, well, let me put it this way. In the Middle Ages and in Shakespeare's day, traditional Catholic theology was the majority of Christians go to purgatory. They spend time in purgatory to be cleansed, to be purged, right? Once that purging is done, they then ascend to heaven. If you go to purgatory, you do not go to hell, ever. Hell's not an option anymore. If you go to hell, you never go up to purgatory or heaven, right? If you go to heaven, you never go back downwards. So, for the day confined to fast and fires, you've got a gloss, probably to do without food. That is asinine. That is an utterly ridiculous gloss. Why? Just think logically. He's dead. Do ghosts speak? No, they're spirits. How's a ghost going to watch the, um, I don't remember if it's the first or second, Pirates of the Caribbean. Barbosa drinks wine and you just see it go through him. And he's like, what's the real bad thing about being dead? It's not having any sensory perceptions. Okay? So he says, till the foul crimes done in my days of nature, that is, when I had a body, are burnt and purged away. So confined to fast in fires, the to fast in fires probably means confined fast in fires. Fast there means firmly. I'm secured in these fires. Or it can't just mean to go without. That's all fasting means. You know, modern day today. Uh, Catholics, when they talk about Lent coming up, you know, Mardi Gras was a few weeks ago. Lent coming up means what? I gotta give up something for Lent. I gotta fast from something. Might be phones, might be TV, might be whatever. Okay? He says, but that I am forbid to tell the secrets of my prison house, I could tell a tale whose lightest word would un would harrow up thy soul. Okay? Earlier we saw the word harrow, and the gloss said lacerations of feelings. Harrow up thy soul. Laceration of feelings, up, that's not what harrow means. Harrow, as I said before, refers to kind of the rapture of the soul. Christ's harrowing of hell, bringing the souls out of hell. Harrow up thy soul means, Hamlet, if I were to tell you, describe for you the pains you have to look forward to in purgatory, it would kill you now. It would freeze thy young blood, make thy two eyes like stars, start from their spheres, etc. Okay? If thou didst ever thy dear father love, O oh God. Why does Hamlet say, O oh God? He knows something big is coming. And we know that because of what he says in a moment, line 40, O oh my prophet. So he goes on. Revenge is foul, the ghost. Line 25. 
Revenge is foul and most unnatural murder. Murder? Murder most foul is in the best it is. That is, even the best of murders is foul. It's rotten. It's corrupt. But this most foul, strange and unnatural. Okay, you've got a gloss for line 25 for unnatural pertaining to fratricide. True, it's very much pertaining to fratricide, but think about that for a moment. I think Shakespeare is also being somewhat, what's the word, facetious, possibly a little bit sarcastic, because think of murder. Think of the history of murder. Think history of murder in kind of Christian theology. What's the first murder? Cain kills Abel. Brother kills brother in the Garden of Eden. In the paradise, the garden, you know. In Hamlet's first soliloquy, he talks about the world being an unweeded garden. And, and this unnatural murder, it's unnatural because it goes against nature to kill another person. It goes against nature to kill your brother, all right? So, Hamlet, tell me, why? So that with wings as swift as meditation or the thoughts of love may sweep to my revenge. Tell me who, and like in the next five minutes, I'll take care of the problem. I find the act, that is, you're ready now. I've, I've softened you up, I've prepared you. So. He says, you think that I died by sleeping in my garden and a serpent came and stung me. That serpent now wears the crown. Notice he doesn't come out literally and say, your uncle killed me. He uses a metaphor. Oh, my prophetic soul, my uncle. Why does Hamlet say, oh, my prophetic soul? He already knows something is wrong. Right after the scene with the king, when the king leaves, Hamlet says, this isn't right. The fact that his mother married her husband's brother, so something is wrong with this image. So the ghost says, I, that incestuous, that adulterous beast, with witchcraft of his wit, et cetera, et cetera. One to his shameful lust, the will of my most seeming virtuous queen. So what's he saying there about Gertrude? Two things. She was tricked. She was seduced, right? Because every seduction is a tricking of some sorts. And two, she seemed virtuous. Seen. There's that verb again. I've written it down several times. It's a subjunctive. It indicates a condition contrary to fact. The fact that she seems virtuous, Hamlet Sr. saying she isn't really. Okay? So, he talks about how she fell away from, you know, his, Hamlet Sr.'s, glory and such. Line 55 and following. So lust, though to a radiant angel linked, will sate itself in a celestial bed and prey on garbage. And he says, stop. I smell the morning air. I've got to hurry because my time for confinement is coming back. So he tells what really happened. Yes, I was sleeping in my orchard, but my brother came and poured poison in my ear. And he died, he says, Line 76, cut off even in the blossoms of my sin, unhouseled, disappointed, unannelled, no reckoning made, but sent to my account with all my perfections, imperfections, excuse me, on my head. It's got a bunch of glosses. Unhouseled, without having received the sacrament. Disappointed, unready, without equipment for the last journey. Unannelled without having received extreme unction. Those are all the same thing. He says, I died 
without being able to say confession first. Confession, not in the Protestant branches of Christianity, in the Catholic and Orthodox branches, confession removes one from sin or removes sin from one. You go, you confess, the priest talks, etc., and then says a blessing, a prayer over you that involves the words about the absolution of sin. Absolution means the removing of sin. If you die at that point, you die in what's called a state of grace. You go straight to heaven. Even in the Catholic system, if you die after receiving last rites, you don't go to purgatory. At least it was thought that. Okay? So, that's why he is suffering during the days. That's why he's probably in purgatory. So he says, avenge my death, but, but, line 84, howsomever thou pursues this act, taint not thy mind, nor let thy soul contrive against thy mother aught. Leave her to heaven. So what does that mean, taint not thy mind? Got a clear bottle of water here. If I were to pull out a dropper with a single drop of black ink and drop that in there, that would no longer be clear. If I were to bring in a 500 gallon vat of white paint and drop a single drop of white paint, it would no longer be white. It would look white, but it would be tainted. So he says, taint not thy mind. Don't let your mind be ruined, darkened, etc. All right? Ghost leaves. Hamlet. Oh, oh you host of heaven. The angelic beings. Oh, earth. And the implication is all the beings on earth. What else? Shall I couple hell? That is, shall I link heaven and earth with hell? Oh, fie, hold, hold my heart. Earlier, we heard Hamlet say, but break my heart, for I must hold my tongue. And then he also said, before, um, right after Horatio and the others tell him about having seen the ghost, he says, be still, my soul. For foul deeds will rise and such. Hold my heart. He's trying, to, he's trying to keep himself in control. He says, remember thee? Aye, thou poor ghost, whilst memory holds a seat in this distracted globe. Distracted globe, confused head. And he points to it. He should point to it. He says, as long as I have any memory up here, yes, I will remember you. And then he says this. From the table of my memory, I'll wipe away all trivial fond records. All saws of books, all forms, all pressures past, that youth and observation copy there. And thy commandment all alone shall live within the book and volume of my brain. The ghost said, don't taint your mind. Hamlet has just said, everything I've learned from the moment I first took a breath until a minute ago, I'll wipe clean. Like, you know, the men in black thing with the little black thing that does the blue light. Everything gone. What's the one thing he's going to have on his mind? Kill Claudius. What has Hamlet just told us he's done? that the ghost told him not to do. He's not only really tainted his mind. Think of his mind as a, as a computer. He's reformatted the hard drive. And now all it can do is kill Claudius. Oh, most pernicious woman. Oh, villain, villain, smiling, damned villain. He says... Uh, so, uncle, there you are, 
now to my word. To his word. That is, now to what? To hold to his word. To stick to his word. Horatio and Marcellus come in. Okay? They talk with Hamlet about it. Hamlet alludes to what he's spoken about. Um, he explains... Line 136, 135, Horatio says, there's no offense, my lord, Hamlet, yes, by St. Patrick, Sunday, there is, Horatio, and much offense too. Touching this vision here, that is the ghost that you have seen, it's an honest ghost. That is, a real, he doesn't mean honest speaks the truth, it's a real ghost. It's not a demon. How does Hamlet know that? What proof does he have that this is a real ghost and not a spirit? Put your name on that and pass it around. <coughs> if you got it, you might get credit. <coughs> he doesn't. He has no proof whatsoever. For your desire to know what is between us, or master it as you may, and now, good friends, we're soldiers, scholars, friends, give me one poor request. That is, don't ask me what the ghost and I talked about. Okay? But I ask of one thing of you. Horatio, what is it? Don't tell anybody what you've seen tonight. Swear it. Horatio, you know, we don't need to swear it. And the ghost cries from under the stage. Swear, you know. So Hamlet gets them to swear. We won't reveal anything about the ghost. And he moves around on the stage to various places. And he has them swear on his sword. Why? How is a sword shaped? Like a cross. So they're swearing on the cross, as it were. He goes on. Horatio says, line 164. Thank you. Horatio says, line 164. O oh, day and night, but this is wondrous strange. Hamlet. And therefore, as a stranger, give it welcome. Hamlet, playing on the old idea there of hospitality, right? Old Germanic literature, old English literature, old Irish, Indian, Russian, Greek, Latin literatures, they all emphasize uh, hospitality in xenophilia. You're not used to that word, you're more used today to the word xenophobia. Fear of strangers, fear of aliens. Xenophilia is love of strangers, love of aliens. And that's because it comes from this, <coughs> comes from the Greek word, xenia, okay? Which means stranger, alien, foreigner, that kind of thing. There's an old, old, old idea. The idea goes back to at least 5,000 BC, all right, that when a stranger comes knocking on your door, you should give that stranger shelter. Give them rest, give them food, etc. Because you don't know whether that stranger is an actual person or a god. St. Paul talks about it in the New Testament in the language of um, entertaining angels unawares. So the idea finds its way into the New Testament, as well as into the Old Testament. Go back in the Old Testament, book of Genesis. The character Lot has a knock on his door and it's three men, angelic angels, right? So he says, therefore as a stranger, that is, this wondrous strange day and night, give it welcome, let it into you, Horatio. 
Just because it's strange doesn't mean you're blocking off. And then he says, there are more things in heaven and earth ratio than are dreamt of in your philosophy. Now, in your philosophy, most readers, maybe not most, many, many readers have said Horatio's philosophy, as I said the other day, was Stoicism. But Horatio did say, you know, my God, when he saw the ghost the first time. Stoics didn't really believe in God. But what it could mean is that Horatio pretty much has a belief system still, even though he said, my God, that all that we can see is what's important, or all that we can see is what is real. Hamlet's going, expand your mind a bit, Horatio. There is more than what you think of as being real. So, he says, to Horatio and the others, how strange or odd, so ere I bear myself, as I perchance hereafter, that is, after this moment, shall think me to put an antic disposition on. Antic. Your gloss says fantastic. No. Antic means frantic. If you're frantic, you're jittery, you're jumpy, you're, you're acting abnormal. How do you, what's a fantastic disposition? I mean, for me, that'd be like, oh man, everything's great, it's wonderful. That's not what it means. He means, if from this point on, I act crazy, don't act like you know. That you at such times see me never shall with arms encumbered thus, you know, folded or entwined like, yeah, we get what Hamlet's doing, or he's shaking your head, or don't give out, he says, aught of me. Don't let anybody know. What is he suggesting he is going to be doing from that point on? To put an antic disposition on means what? I had two words written over here the other day. Playing or play acting. And the other one, pretending. If I pretend to be, okay, don't act like you know. So grace and mercy are at your most help need help you. Ghosts make some swear, they swear. So Hamlet says, with all my love, do I commend me, myself to you? And what so poor man as Hamlet is may do to express his love and befriending to you, God willing, shall not lack. That is, what I can do to help you, to benefit you after this, you won't lack anything. All right? Let us go on together and still your fingers on your lips. That is, shh, keep your mouths closed. The time is out of joint. Oh, cursed spite that ever I was born to set it right. What does that mean? The time is out of joint. It's the image of the great chain of being. The link of time is missing. And interestingly, Hamlet says that he was born to set it right. In other words, in the, great, in the grand scheme of things, it's like God knew this is what's going to happen, and therefore God governed the world so that I was born for one purpose, to fix the problem. That usually implies something on the part of the person doing the fixing. That is, that person has to be the one to fill the hole in the dam. It usually implies death. Okay? Act two. We're back in Polonius' house. Okay? And Polonius is talking with his man named Reynaldo. And what are they talking about? Last time we saw Polonius, what was he doing? talking with Ophelia. Before that, talking with Laertes, giving Laertes advice. 
but talking with Ophelia, saying, I've heard about you in Hamlet, and so he gives her advice. And now, he's talking with Reynaldo about his, Polonius' son, Laertes. He's sending Reynaldo off to Paris to do what? To spy on his son. So, he's kind of been spying on his daughter. He's had people come and tell him about his daughter in Hamlet. Now he's spying on his son. Why? He gave his son very specific advice, very specific proverbs, so to speak, to follow. He wants to see if he's following his advice. Okay? Wants to make sure he's not gaming, gambling, all that kind of stuff. So Ronaldo says, I'll do it, and he leaves. Ophelia comes in. And Polonius says, how now, Ophelia? What's the matter? Verbal stage direction. She doesn't just walk in amicably and calmly and peacefully. She comes in startled. Oh, my Lord, my Lord, I've been so affrighted. He goes, what, what, in the name of God, what's wrong? My Lord, as I was sewing in my closet, that is, in her room, <coughs> Lord Hamlet, with his doublet all embraced, no hat upon his head, his stockings fouled, unguarded, down giant to his ankle, pale as a shirt, his knees knocking each other, he, came, he comes into her room. So, the description we've just been given of Hamlet is of someone who is suffering from love sickness. Love sickness was an actual medical diagnosis in Shakespeare's day. Its symptoms were these. So he comes in, we're told, with his doublet all unbraced. His doublet is like a tight, a very tight um, vest that one, swear, that one wears. It's untied, so it's open. What else? He's not wearing a hat, okay? His stockings, which should be pulled up, and tied firmly, are untied and rolled down to beneath his ankles. Okay. He, his face is pale as his shirt. That is, he's like white as a ghost. His knees are knocking together, and with a look so piteous and purported as if he had been loosed out of hell to speak of horrors, he comes before me. Question. Is Hamlet putting on an antic disposition? And if he is, why is he? Why is he doing this to Ophelia? The last time we heard anything about Hamlet and Ophelia was when Ophelia was talking to Polonius. And she says, everything Hamlet has done in our conversations, in our interactions, has been holy, pure, virtuous, you know, Almost sacred. Polonius, man for thy love? Has he gone crazy because of his love for you? I, I, I don't know, but I fear it. What did he say? And she says, he took me by the wrist and held me hard. Then he goes to the length of his arm. So he takes her wrist and holds it. And then he steps away so that his hand is here holding her wrist. And he does this kind of thing. And with his other hand thus over his brow, he falls to such perusal of my face. So he looks at her like this, like he can't really see her properly, as if, if he would draw it. Long, steady, so at last a little shaking of mine arm, that is, she'd like, let go. Thrice his head waving up and down, he raised a sigh. It shattered, that is, he shook, and he let her go. He seemed to find his way without his eyes, for out of doors he went without their helps, and to the last bended their light on me. So she's here, the door's there, and Hamlet just walks away like this. We gotta go talk to the king. 
This is the very ecstasy of love. Ecstasy means out of body experience. That's what ecstasy literally means. Here, it means he's out of his mind. And he says, whose violent property fordoes itself and leads the will to desperate undertakings as oft as any passion under heaven that does afflict our natures. People do stupid things for love. He's suggesting Hamlet may harm himself. I am sorry. Have you given him any hard words of late? She goes, no, I did as you commanded. I repelled his letters and denied his... That hath made him mad. That sent Hamlet over the edge. I am sorry that with better heed and judgment, I had not quoted him. Quoted there means that I had not, with better heed and judgment, portrayed his mindset to you. Because what did he say all of Hamlet's words in, in tenders meant? He's just trying to get in her pen. I feared he did but trifle and meant to rack thee, rack, to get her horizontal, okay, to bear himself upon you. But beshrew my jealousy, that is, curse my suspicions, your boss says. By heaven it is proper to our age, that is, to old men, to cast beyond ourselves and our opinions, that it is common for the younger sort to lack discretion. What's he mean? I forgot what it's like to be in love. Okay? So, scene two. We're at the castle, and the king welcomes in, the king and queen, welcome in two men, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. We find out Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are friends of Hamlet. Okay? And the king says, you know that Hamlet's been a little out of sorts of late. Hamlet's transformation, so call it. Why? Because neither the exterior nor the inward man resembles that it was. Hamlet seems to be a different person than he used to be. Okay? So why is he brought, why is he called for them? I want you who were brought up with him, he says, line 11, That by your companies, 14, to draw him on to pleasures and to gather as you can, as you are able, whether aught to us unknown afflicts him. Using subterfuge, being subtle, figure out what is bothering Hamlet. That, once we know what's bothering him, we can remedy it. So the queen says, he's spoken often of you too. He loves you dearly. Please do this. And they say, we will. Okay. By the way, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are entirely interchangeable. They are, in, in a metaphorical sense, they are faceless characters. They're stock images. You're going to hear one, at one point, one of the kings, one of the people is going to say Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, and the queen's going to say Guildenstern of Rosencrantz. Showing these two are indistinguishable from each other. Okay? So, they leave, and ambassadors come in. Okay? And the king says, you know, you're always the father of good news. He says that to Polonius. Polonius, have I? Line 42. It says, I hold my duty as I hold my soul, both to my God and to my gracious king. That is, I am bound to you as I am bound to God. All right? So, Polonius says, I think I found out the cause of Hamlet's lunacy. Tell me, Polonius, let's listen to the ambassadors first. Okay? So, 
The king says, uh, bring in the ambassadors. And then he tells Gertrude. Polonius knows what's the cause of Hamlet's problems. The queen, 56, I doubt, that is, I expect, it is no other but the main, that is, the main problem, the big issue, his father's death and our over-hasty marriage. I think the problem is his father died and we got married too quickly. Okay? So, the ambassadors come in, King sends them back off, we're not going to talk about um, what they say. And Polonius addresses the king and queen. My liege and madam to expostulate what majesty should be, what duty is, why day is day, night, night, and time is time, were nothing but to waste night, day, and time. Therefore, since brevity is the soul of wit, <coughs> and tediousness the limbs and outward flourishes, I will be brief. Your noble son is mad. Okay. Notice it took him, what, eight lines to say that. He's the one who's tedious. He wastes time. Which is why the queen says, more matter with less art. Get to the point, get to the matter that you're speaking about with less rhetoric, less artifice. He says, I don't use any art. So he goes on using a lot of words. Bear in mind, what was one of his pieces of advice to his son? Keep your thoughts to yourself. He's not following his own advice. So, <coughs> he says, I have a daughter, 106, while she's mine, who in her duty and obedience hath given me this, that is, he shows them a letter Hamlet wrote to Ophelia. The king asks, 127 or so, how hath she received his love? What do you think of Polonius asks the king, what kind of man do you think I am? It's, uh, you're faithful and honorable. I would fain prove so, but what might you think when I'd seen this hot love on the wing, as I perceive it, what might you or the queen think if I had played the desk or table book or given my heart a winking? That is, what would you think if I had allowed this relationship to continue? or looked upon it with idle sight, what would you think? He says, no. Once I found out, I said, cut it off. Lord Hamlet, 140, is a prince out of thy star. He said, Ophelia, he's too good for you. And he says, it is because of that that Hamlet is mad. Think so? Queen, you know, it could be Polonius. Have there been such a time, I would fain know that, that I pot positively said, tis so, when I was wrong? Uh, not that I know of. Polonius says, then take this from this. And the first this he points to his head, and the second this he points to his shoulder. Cut my head off if I'm wrong. This time. It's a little foreshadowing, by the way. He's not going to literally get his head cut off, but he is going to get killed. King, how can we prove it? How can we try it further? Try there means prove. Polonius. You know, he sometimes walks for hours in here in the lobby. Queen, yeah, he does. Polonius, 160. At such a time, I'll loose my daughter to him. Be you and I behind an heiress then, that is behind a curtain, to mark the encounter, that is, we'll watch and listen. If he love her not, he says, let me be no assistant. If I'm wrong, based upon our overhearing this conversation, fire me. Okay? Hamlet comes in reading a book, and we're going to have to stop here. Hamlet comes in reading a book, and Polonius says, I'll, what's the term he uses? I'll board him. Board is a naval term, like when you board a vessel. But it's the kind of term used when 
the sailors on one vessel want to board another vessel to take control of it. What they literally do is they have a long board with spikes on the end that they throw down across the two decks. Okay? So he's saying, I will accost them. That's where we'll pick up on Monday. Have a good weekend. Get through act, uh, probably act three for Monday. We won't get all the way through it, but we'll definitely get through 